Good morning and welcome to the webinar on practical strategies for engaging with students with intellectual disabilities and autism in the emerging online higher education environment. We are delighted that Angela Guevara, Stacy Eldred, and Dr. Michael Hoggett accepted the invitation to present today. Before I officially introduce our presenters, please allow me to address a few logistical items. I am Will Francis, Project Director for Post-Secondary Education at the UCLA Tarjan Center. The Tarjan Center at UCLA is a federally designated center for excellence in developmental disabilities and your host for today's webinar. Support for today's webinar comes from the California Community College's Chancellor's Office to a contract that enables us to provide technical assistance and training to California Community College's Disabled Students Programs and Services Professionals who are working to provide equitable supports, services, and opportunities for students with disabilities, including intellectual disability and autism. Today's webinar is designed to respond to emerging needs to support students in the wake of the novel coronavirus. The Tarjan Center is working very closely with our federal partners comprised of the University Center on Developmental Disabilities at the University of Southern California and UC Davis Mine Institute, as well as the State Council on Developmental Disabilities and Disability Rights of California. We are working with those federal partners as well as the Department of Developmental Services to get information out to communities regarding the COVID-19 virus. The current slide provides links to information and resources that may be useful. The Department of Developmental Services and the regional centers in particular may be a useful resource for students and their families. Students in need of assistance may contact their regional center counselor and the other resources on the page may be helpful as well. For today's webinar, some of our colleagues are unable to participate and have requested a recording of the proceedings. To facilitate access to a clean recording of the webinar, we have muted all calls. As we proceed to the presentation, our presenters would love to respond to questions that arise from or that are related to the content of the presentation. Please look at the bottom of the Zoom program display where you will find a chat or text box. We are asking that you insert your questions into the chat box throughout the duration of the webinar. We will address your questions and welcome you to submit as many questions as naturally arise. You may ask questions through the chat feature at any time. Each presentation will last approximately 30 minutes and then we will offer 10 minutes for questions. At the end of the presentation, if time permits, we will feel additional questions. This may be a good time to test the chat feature. Please take this opportunity to enter a greeting into the chat box. Thank you very much. I see many of you are doing that. I hope that you and your families are doing well in this uh, critical time. Many of your institutions were having conversations and initiating practices designed to improve outcomes that are focused on increasing the number of students who earn a degree, credential, certificate, or transfer to four-year institutions, or to attain employment in high-demand jobs. In the advent of the COVID-19 crisis, it will be important for the colleges to engage with students with an intellectual disability and students with autism as soon as possible in the new online environment. In today's presentation, our presenters will share emerging practices and practical strategies for engaging students with ID and autism in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic. They will share elements of their planning, training, implementation, and follow through in the transition to online instruction, as well as lessons they've learned, their observations, and early signs of student engagement. To all of our webinar participants, thank you for joining us today. 
And now I will provide some information about our presenters. Angela Guevara is an associate professor and faculty coordinator for the Adults with Disabilities Program at San Diego Canyon College Division of Continuing Education. She earned a master's degree in special education from National University, where she specialized in mild to moderate disability studies. Ms. Guevara has over 10 years of professional teaching experience at community colleges, where she has worked with adult students with disabilities. She was hired to create a new program for individuals with an intellectual and developmental disability that focuses on employability skills for successful competitive integrated employment and that assists students to transfer to the credit side of the college with the intention of earning a certificate or a degree. The San Diego Canyon College Adults with Disabilities Program won the 2019 Regional Center of Orange County Spotlight Award that is conferred upon individuals and organizations who advocate for and work with people with developmental and other disabilities. Stacy Eldred is a department chair and coordinator for the Adult Education Oasis program serving adults with disabilities at Saddleback College. She earned a master's degree in special education from Chapman University and holds an education specialist credential. Stacy has nearly 12 years of professional teaching experience working alongside adult students with disabilities. She earned a Supported Employment and Transition Specialist Certificate from San Diego State University. In addition to her part-time faculty role as coordinator, department chair, and instructor for the OASIS program at Saddleback College, Stacy is an adult transition teacher. She has extensive experience preparing course materials and developing curriculum for a diverse group of students with varying needs and abilities. Dr. Michael Huggett holds master's degrees in special education and public policy and administration. He also holds a PhD in higher education policy with an emphasis in disability policy. His work has received various awards, including Saddleback College's 2017 President's Award for Innovation and Leadership for his development of Saddleback College's OASIS program for adults with disabilities. He was also named Saddleback College's Professor of the Year in 2019. His work on disability policy in higher education, as well as the intersection of faith and disabilities, has been published in various outlets, including the Journal of the Christian Institute on Disability, the Community College Review, the Community College Journal of Research and Practice, Prism Magazine, and Focus on the Family. In addition to his role at Saddleback College, he is a lecturer in higher education policy for the Graduate School of Education at the University of California, Riverside. Dr. Huggett serves on the Board of Directors for Friendship Ministries, Inc., an international ministry whose purpose is to provide resources that support faith formation and congregational inclusion with individuals with intellectual disabilities. Additionally, Dr. Huggett is the founding president of the Disability Ministry Conference, a regional nonprofit designed to provide inclusive practices in local churches. Thank you, Angela, Stacy, and Dr. Huggett for your willingness to share your lived and professional experiences with the California Community Colleges. And now, without further ado, here is Angela Guevara. Thanks, Will. Such a great uh, intro. I am trying. Okay, so uh, welcome. Thank you for sharing your Fridays with us. I know Fridays are a little bit different now, but um, they're starting to become somewhat normal. Um, so my name is Angela Guevara, and I am the Faculty Coordinator Associate Professor for Santiago Canyon College Adults with Disabilities Program. And uh, Will asked me to share what we have been doing in response to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And then I'm gonna also share with you what um, I think I'm gonna be doing for the beginning of the 2020-21 school year. So I'm gonna start with the week of March 9th 
Although I'd like to say that this actually um, started a little bit before then, because from what I remember, and it wasn't so long ago, but it feels like it was forever ago, um, towards the end of February, you kind of got the feeling that something was changing, something drastically was gonna change. Um, there weren't as many people in restaurants. Um, their news was coming out, people were talking. And so that's when I really started thinking about what are we gonna do? What needs to be done? in order to make this transition as smoothly for the students as possible. Because what goes on behind the scenes it doesn't matter because what the students need to see is the consistency. And that was my main thing. I want things to just be smooth and consistent for them. And um, that's actually worked out pretty well for us. I'll, I'll get into that in a little bit. But um, so, okay, so the week of March 9th, um, beginning of March, we, again, I started thinking, okay, what if, what if, what if, um, admin was still doing their thing and nobody really knew what was going to happen. We hadn't received any actual uh, directions from our chancellor or from our, our presidents. It was just kind of a talk. But what I did is I decided to go into each of our classes and have all students complete the open CCC applications. Because um, if you're unaware, students need to have those applications completed before they can um, access Canvas, at least for online classes. So I wanted to make sure that that part was just done. And that application can be a little bit tricky, uh, especially for our student population. So um, going into the classrooms and doing it with each of them was very helpful. So that was a big part, and I think that was part of our our success is that we actually did that with each of the students instead of having them to do it on their own and then contacting us with questions and it can get frustrating. I wanted to try and leave that frustration as much as possible. So that was done. And then after that, the students were all taught um, how to open up Canvas. So classes, um, the instructors, even though they had great lesson plans or they had something they wanted to do that day, it was kind of derailed into here's what might happen, here's how we're gonna continue class. And so again, the students were taught up how to open up Canvas and how to navigate um, Canvas and how to get, find their classrooms and how to log on to the classrooms and how to identify a module and how to identify Confer Zoom. Um, we were also gave them um, directions for links to Canvas support to our help desk and to web advisor those three links were probably the most important um, especially web advisor because if you don't know your web advisor and your password you cannot get onto canvas so we made sure that all the students wrote down their web advisor and their passwords and then we had them share it with their instructors because a lot of times they'll come back and they'll email and they'll say, I don't, I don't know what my email is or I don't know what my password is. And it's a, it's a process to have them go through and reset it. It's, it's not a process, but it is. And so just because again, we wanted to make this transition as smooth as possible, we had the information on hand as well. So I think that was very helpful um, also. Um, and then again, we were very, uh, conversations were started with possible what ifs. What if, what if we don't get to come back to campus? What if we do? What if um, I don't have access to technology? What if I don't have a computer at home? What if um, I don't feel comfortable? What if I'm scared? What if I'm just scared of what's happening? Open communication was imperative at this point um, because Nobody knew. Nobody knew what was going to happen. And it was just better to be upfront and honest um, with everybody and, and in order to, to, you know, get to where we're at today. Um, instructors were also given workshops and webinars on temporary remote instruction. I was very lucky. My instructors were or have gone through the Canvas training. Um, in order to teach online for our college, you have to complete a Canvas training. And so um, they've either done it or they are going through, they were going through it. So they knew how to build a Canvas shell, a Canvas course with um, modules that had accessibility 
And so even though they hadn't actually taught online or through temporary remote instruction, they at least knew how to build a classroom. So in that aspect, I was, I was very grateful and lucky that they already had that experience. All right. So then the next week, students were officially off campus. It was super fast. They were there one day and then they were gone the next. Um, so they were all sent home and we had three days, three working days to uh, get everything set up and then to start classes again. Uh, instructors that week, so the week of March 16th, we weren't um, officially asked to be off campus yet, only students. So the instructors came in on their days that they were actually teaching classes. So if an instructor was teaching Monday, Wednesday from nine to 11, that instructor came in that Monday from nine to 11, completed a mock um, class with the support, with my support in there. We walked through the canvas. Um, she, it was like a teaching demo. She taught um, how she was gonna do with canvas and it kind of helped her work out the kinks and the um, issues as much as possible because there are still issues that happen. Like conference Zoom decided to go down, um, your Wi-Fi doesn't work, something is gonna happen. But for the most part, it was kind of a mock walkthrough and I was there to answer any questions or to point out something that I felt that the students might find um, difficult. And then, and then that happened for all instructors. So they all came in during that week and we did a mock run through of their classes. And then students were all contacted through email, um, through, um, through email and through Canvas by each of their instructors, giving them the links, um, again, the links how to get to Canvas, um, how to log in, and when they were expected to log in, which was the, that following Wednesday, they were expected to log in on class. Our campus decided that we were going to hold classes as the same time, same day as face-to-face -face classes, which has also worked into our favor. Um, and again, I'll go into more into that. Let's see. Uh, so then the third week, the week of March 23rd, classes officially reconvened through TRI. Yes, faculty worked from home, um, which was, it, it, it was a little rough the first week. Um, again, like I said, some instructors had issues with their Wi-Fi, some um, were having issues with conference Zoom, and so there was a lot of texting going back and forth between me and the instructors, and the instructors were trying to email the students, and it was a little, it was a little chaotic. I'm not, I'm not gonna lie, there was a little bit of chaos going on, but it is what it is, and it was just had to be dealt with, and it eventually smoothed its way out. Um, and then we've also, um, so uh, going back to um, the six, this, well, uh, let's dig. so going back to what we had done in the previous two weeks, I believe really um, kind of led, laid the foundation of our success for our attendance because all of our classes have had 100% attendance. We've lost none of the students. Um, they've all continued to log on and be successful in their classes. And I think that was because we provided them with so much support and so much, um, so many walkthroughs prior to them actually leaving the campus. Um, like I said, I have made myself, oh, I haven't said this, but I have made myself available to my instructors pretty much 24 seven. I feel like I work more now than I have ever worked before. <laughs> um, and I think that's just because when you're working from home or you're, working in such a such a new situation and you're trying to acclimate to everything you just kind of just work 24 7. I you know I might get a text at 9 p.m. at night because an instructor is trying to um, upload a YouTube video or embed it into the canvas course and it's not working so the support seems to be 24 7 um, and emails emails are are a lot I don't know about you but I think I've doubled and tripled my emails in the last month than I've ever had before in my life. Okay, currently, so like I said, um, we've had, we've actually been very successful. We've had 100% of students transition to TRI. Some of them, you know, may have taken, so there was one example, we've had, we had one instructor had one student who just could not access campus. He just could not get into it. And he was there the day we did a walkthrough, but for whatever reason, he was just having so many issues. 
And so in order to still count his attendance, the instructor just emailed, emailed back and forth, um, emailed his, his packet or whatever the assignment was for the day. And as long as there is that, if, you, if you've taught online, you know you need to have regular effective communication with students and you need to have proof that you have that regular effective communication. And so what I told my instructors that TRI is not online teaching, which is very confusing to a lot of people because essentially you are online teaching, but they're calling it TRI. So um, the instruct, the only difference is, I believe, the only difference I've seen so far is that you don't have to have that certificate to teach online for TRI versus if you're going to teach 100% online, you have to have that certificate. So I'm going back to the regular effective communication. Um, if the students have had issues, it's all, you know, email them. Email them. Um, I had an issue in my own class the other day and I could not conference Zoom. Zoom just kept kicking me out, kicking me out, kicking me out, kicking me out. And it was kicking out the IA that I have in the classroom too, which is another thing I wanted to share. Um, I don't know if you're aware of it and you hopefully you are, but if you have IAs in your classrooms, they can be um, given a role in your Canvas shell or course module or whatever course classroom as a TA. So they can go in there and they can, um, they have a little bit more um, access than the students do, do, but they don't have as much as we would as instructors. So um, the day that we had an issue with Zoom and I couldn't get in, I was texting my IA and she was trying to get in and we couldn't get, get in. And, and instead of having to go through web advisor and email all the students and tell them, hey, I'm having issues um, because when you're not online right when you say you're going to be the students start to panic or they're just like oh no class today and then they don't they just don't come back so that was a good learning experience for us so i am now using remind so that i can quickly text my students if i'm having technology issues which is very helpful and it, it's immediate because sending an email is great but everybody is available by text today and it's so much quicker and faster and um, it lets the students know what's happening and so that they don't you know they're not like oh it's a it's, it's a free day i don't have to go to class they kind of stick around until things work out and then if the zoom hadn't ended up working we would have just used the chat box you got to be flexible i've learned that flexibility is the key to this i do not have control over anything really. So the things that I do have control over, I really have to make sure I utilize um, everything I can to continue to make the transition smooth for students. Hi, Angela, it's Will. I have a quick question. Okay. There are folks who are asking what the acronym TRI stands for, and I'll mute myself now. Oh, okay. So TRI stands for Temporary Remote Instruction, which is what our college went to for spring semester unless you were unless the classes were already scheduled as online which are considered 100 percent online then all the face-to-face -face classes transitioned to tri temporary remote instruction and that is um, they were encouraged to utilize canvas because you can again like i said it has proof and you have um attendance it, you can you can you can utilize everything can be done through canvas but um some instructors have chosen to use uh, microsoft teams or google hangouts cranium cafe everybody kind of had their choice it's kind of like academic freedom they had their choice how they were going to continue to teach their classes but for the most part everybody has decided to use canvas i hope that answers that question so student feedback, ah, wow. So student feedback has been really positive. And I think it's, it goes back to us being very honest with them in the first place. Uh, when this all started, everybody was so unsure about what even COVID-19 was or is or how, how it started or how it's gonna affect or what it's gonna lead to. It's a lot of times people, uh, students, 
we talked about the walking dead and I was like, let's not go there yet. <laughs> let's, 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 uh, let's see how this works out because I am not equipped to deal with running on a daily basis. So we were, we were very open and matter of fact about what was happening. Um, and I think that helped out a lot. I have heard from, so our instructors were given the option to teach First, we're, let me back up. First, we were told we had to stay, we had to do temporary remote instruction the same time, the same day we were teaching classes, face-to-face -face classes. So again, if I was teaching Monday, Wednesday from 11 to 1, I was expected to be online from 11 to 1. Then the union got involved and they made a note saying that we may not be able to make that happen. So, but I have found that keeping the same time and the same um, day as my face-to-face -face classes has provided the students some consistency, which is really helpful in their lives right now. And I have gotten the feedback from a lot of family members um, because, you know, when you're online, you're kind of, you meet all their family. Everybody's in the background. There's parents walking in and out. There's animals. There's just all kinds of background and which is good and it can be bad. I've, I've realized um, not only is a student in your classroom, but their caregivers and their families are also seeing what they're learning. So it's kind of like you're, you're having to be, I, I feel, I personally feel like I have to be extra, but I have to be really good at what I'm doing and teaching and maintaining classroom uh, management skills and, and all that because the parents are now in the classroom with us kind of, or the caregivers if the students are doing it from home. Um, but like I, I said, um, not only have the students been really happy, they always say how happy they are with Zoom because they get to see each other online. They still get to interact with each other. Um, they work with each other and they do, um, you know, they do breakout rooms. Canvas allows you to have breakout rooms so you can put them into rooms together. Um, if they're doing multiple, say I'm teaching a math class. So if I want them to practice their multiplication and time each other, I can put two people in a breakout room and then I can jump in and out of rooms. Um, but the students have been very happy to see each other. They are, it's just like the classroom in the classroom, except it's just all virtual at this point. And they're learning new skills. They've all, um, They've learned how to have a movie night, a virtual streaming. So Netflix party, that's that I've heard that they have been starting to do that. So they're actually starting to do more together socially than they were when they were on campus. And the feedback I've gotten from the parents is that they've been really grateful that we've still provided consistency because things are so inconsistent right now and things have been changing so dramatically and quickly that, um, this is kind of one thing in, in, in the students' lives that are, is still the same. So I'm, I'm really glad that we can provide that. And um, the instructors are starting to feel comfortable with their changes. There's still a lot to be learned. Um, teaching remotely is, it's different. It's a, it, it's a lot more work. You have a lot more prep to do. Um, there is a lot of what ifs, what if this doesn't work? Um, for example, again, I'm teaching a math class. So on Monday, we're going to do virtual field trips to museums because art and math are related. So I'm already starting to think, okay, well, what if this link doesn't work? And what if I lose them halfway? And it's, you got to really just think ahead and prepare for what might happen. But the instructors are starting to feel comfortable and they've already started asking me about uh, what's going to happen. So let me talk about that. Uh, we have, Santiago Canyon has already decided that we are going to be completely online for summer. That was not shocking. Um, luckily, summer is, a, is um, scheduled. There's less classes scheduled. Um, and so I feel like I, as the coordinator, I have a little bit more control over, over the classrooms um, and the amount of students that will be attending. Uh, for fall, they haven't said anything, but I'll share with you what I'm doing. I am acting as if we will not be back on campus for fall either. Um, just by going on what the governor's been saying and um, what people are talking about and the news and just kind of reading into things and seeing how things are going, I am going to ask, after I do the schedule, I'm going to ask all my instructors to build 
their classes completely online. And if we do end up back in the classroom, at least they are prepared for the possibility of having to go back to temporary remote instruction. I think it's better to be prepared um, for anything and everything because the bottom line is, is we're still about the students and the students, again, don't need to see our chaos in the background. They just want to be taught and they want to be happy and they want to learn and they want to see their friends and they want to see their instructors. And if it takes me 30 hours to create two hours of a, of a classroom environment that's positive and they are looking forward to coming back to the next class, then that's what needs to happen. So that's where we are. Um, here's my contact information. Uh, if you have any questions or, or want anything or anything at all, just please contact me. Again, I have, am available at all times and all days and all hours of the night. So feel free to contact me and I will just continue to share my story and what we've been doing. It may or may not work for your college. It may, but um, you don't know until you try. Thank you so much, Angela. Be careful what you ask for because they indeed, <laughs> they indeed do have questions for you. So okay. <laughs> in sharing questions from, I believe the very first one that came in is this one. How many uh, students with ID does Rancho San Diego serve? And what are some examples of the courses that you are offering? So that's a good question. Um, I wanna say that at least, 30% of our students are IDE students, and they usually um, are in a day program, and they come um, to the campus. So they have to be, uh, some of the criteria is that they have to be able to be in the classroom without an aide. Um, the aide can stay outside the classroom, or they can you know, draw, be dropped off, picked up, but, um, so it's it's probably a lesser percentage, but they are we still have we still serve the students. Um, one of the classes that is very popular right now is the social media class, and so they are learning about what's uh, cyberbullying and how to create a LinkedIn account and um, how to make a blog or how to you know what's proper email etiquette and. I, as I stated before, I think is we have an instructional assistant in each classroom. So once you get to know your class, you kind of know who's going to need a little bit more support and how they're going to need to be supported. And our instructional assistant tends to work with um, students who have more needs than others in the classroom. So that's how they are supported. So I, I know that there's a question for Angela's contact information again. Uh, I think, Angela, what we'll do is when uh, Stacy, oh, okay, if you can do that now, that's fine. Uh, I was going to say as another option, we could put your contact info in the chat and that will work. Um, okay, perfect. Yeah. So let me move to the next question. And again, Stacy, you can tee up so that we'll be ready to go once we're done with these questions. Thank you so much. Okay, so the next question was... Um, Canvas Zoom Cranium, uh, what other online tools are you using for collaboration and instruction? I have just been using Canvas. Okay. Canvas okay. is so easy. Uh, it's all right there. You can, you can Zoom, you can share your screen, you can use videos, you can Im embed almost anything and everything into your classroom via Canvas. Mm -hmm. uh, I have also utilized email as a big thing. And then I've also uh, utilized Remind. So the students are, I'm going to, I'm also going to get, there's a thing where you can get like a Google number, I believe, and you can link it to your actual phone number. And I'm going to actually do that so they can text me directly because a lot of times, um, a lot of times, even like if they were on the, the campus, they would send me an email or they would send their friend a text saying, can you tell Angela that I'm going to be 20 minutes late to class? Even though I've said, this is college, <laughs> you, you're going to be late to class, just come to class when nobody needs to know, you don't have to let your instructor know, um, but they still do it. So even if they are late getting online, they like to let us know. And I think just it, it texting is so much quicker. 
So I believe you spoke to the number of students that are served, and I believe you said something about the courses. Uh, this second question had to do with how many courses are offered and are all the courses held on, so I, I take it when you're face-to-face, -face, are, are these courses held on campus? Yes, all the classes were held on campus except for two of them, which were scheduled as 100% online. So those classes were very easy because they just continued as is. The five, four, four classes that were on campus are now through temporary remote instruction. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, for a student requiring one-to-one -one support, according to IPE due to quadriplegia, school unable to send staff home, nor find an MPA that has one-to-one -one aid available to give hands-on support. Regional Center refused to provide services during the school day. IHSS reevaluation, the case manager gave the family two additional hours per week. What is the family's recourse? I don't know if that's something that you can address. Maybe if you can't, maybe our um, additional speakers can cover this, or maybe this is something that's involved and we answer at the, the end. Yeah, I don't think that I would be, um, I would be able to answer that. Okay. as well as I would like to. Great, okay. Are the students you are referring to in a specific ID ASD special uh, class, special classes only? Are you speaking of mainstream or included students? Our okay, so that's a really good question. Um, continuing education, we, you cannot, okay, so this is this kind of, okay. They are, our classes are open to anybody. We cannot tell student, you cannot take our class because we are a public institution and our classes are open to anybody. But with the title of the department, Adults with Disabilities, when a student who does not have a disability sees that, they tend to see, oh, you know what, this class is inappropriate for me. So we may have one or two ES, it's usually an ESL student who wants to take our classes um, just because it's like social skills or social media or, or something of that nature. But for the most part, they are all classes with students who have disabilities. Great, thank you. Um, I believe the next question asks uh, how students were acclimating to this transition. Uh, just a minute, what's this? Do you want to? Sorry, I have, how are they? I have too many yeah. things open. Just a second. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Um, are, you finding, are you finding that your students are resilient to this transition? Uh, uh, or are you finding specific challenges? And if you could speak to those. I am, that's a, I'm so glad you asked that question. I have found that our students are on this. They are so much better than we, first of all, I already knew this, but a lot of people have these assumptions that our students can't do this and they can. They've been doing it. They are better at it than I am. They are, are just, they're so, once that, you know, it's, I think again, it's the walking through, getting them started. And then they're, they're so fast at it. Um, the, the hardest people to get on to this temporary remote instruction or online teaching train is, is actually other faculty who don't want to do it, who are just fighting against this. And, and I'm like, you can't, you can't fight. If this is here. You are either going to have to get on this train or you're, or you're got to get off because I just, I don't have time to deal with the fighting or the, you know, I, you just need, I need you to help me continue to make this program as best for the students. And so, yes, the students are resilient. They are so easy to work with and again i preface it as hey you guys you know what this is you're learning a whole set of new skills maybe one day you might work from home and now you're able to zoom you know how to connect with clients or you know how to connect with customers uh you're going to be able to this is a whole set of skills that you're learning that you didn't even know that you were going to be learning so it's kind of fun it's fun for all of us great thank you um so we'll give a couple of minutes and then we'll move on to the next presentation, but I wanted to see if I could get some more questions in. Um, so what pushback did you get from students that are in group homes and without technology? 
Okay, first question with with group homes day programs um, because they uh, the student okay so the students usually who are going to day programs have have had a, a more difficult time uh, transitioning but they have been slow they've been a little not that they haven't been able to do it they've just taken a little bit more time to get on to their uh, to their canvas class to their online classroom platforms and. I have offered to work with those who are uh, in the group homes uh, because they aren't, uh, they, because the day programs are not meeting right now, they are still at their group homes, but they are still continuing to get online. Now they may not be online at, at, during the classroom time. They may be logging in later during the day or they may be um, emailing, but we are still connected and, and they are still learning. What was the second part? Will, uh, what about did you get did you get pushback from students that are in group homes and without technology? Okay, so the technology issue that has seemed to a uh, surprising surprisingly there seems to be a lot more students out there who do not have uh, access to computers at home. So the college, as a college wide, has um, offered to let students take home laptops. Uh, so if any student has had issues with technology or with not having access to technology, we have provided them information where they can come and it's like a, it's a borrow, they can borrow a laptop until we are all back on campus. And using that laptop, they are able to use our IT department for any technical issues that they may have. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, so let me see if I can um, combine a question or two. I want to reserve some time for our pres other presenters. And then, um, Angela, if you would, um, once uh, Stacy and Dr. Huggett begin, if you could take a look, I will send you a text so that you can know where to begin looking in the chat, and then maybe okay. respond to some of these in the chat. Um, okay. So next question then had to do with, by the way, so for peers, um, Please do take a look at the questions in the chat because some of the questions um, are really to the participants and not to the presenter per se. So um, if everyone could keep looking at the chat, that would be great. Um, how, are you, how are you captioning your videos through Canvas if you're doing that? You have to be, yeah, you have to, you have to make sure that it's, it's captioned prior to showing them. So I have, uh, if it's, if it's a YouTube video, I look at those prior to embedding them into the module to show them. Um, but a lot of it has been in person. So Zoom allows me to talk to you in person and there is a closed caption option that they can use. Great. I haven't had a lot of, um, I haven't had any, actually any issues with that yet. Okay, great. Thank you. This will be the last. And then Stacy and Dr. Huggett can uh, do their presentation. After Dr. Huggett's and Stacy's presentation, we will field questions for them. And then after their set of questions, we can come back to any additional questions that you have for Angela. But here's the last piece. Um, are there any conserved students? Are there any barriers to a video recording and dissemination as it may be downloaded to the personal devices after the recordings are available? Have any conservators disallowed any video recordings if this is something the instructors are utilizing in their classes? Because of that issue, I have told, I have it made it clear that we are not allowed to record. And do you, it, are you serving conserved students? Yes. Okay. Yes. All right, great. Thank you so much, Angela, for fielding bravely these questions. Um, and again, I will send you a text message so that you would know where to begin to screen the questions in, in the chat. Thank you so All much. All right, perfect. Thank you. Uh, Stacy, Dr. Haggard, take it away. All right, thank you, Will. So I know everyone participating today is well aware of the challenges our community colleges are facing right now due to the COVID-19 pandemic. And we're gonna get straight into sharing how we took our non-credit OASIS program for adults with disabilities at Saddleback College 
and transitioned all of our courses online in a very short period of time. Uh, we have nearly 200 students, many who are older and live in group homes uh, with little to no technology skills or support at home, as well as younger students who are pretty tech savvy. As we mentioned, my name is Stacey Eldred and Michael Hoggett is joining me. You'll be hearing from both of us throughout this presentation. So we're going to share kind of a sequence of events that happened and have broken it down into making a decision to go online, what we did and how we prepared to go online, how we implemented going online, and how we are evaluating as we go. And I'd like to start by sharing that we have a very strong foundation in the OASIS program with our faculty, staff, and administration. Um, our foundation was built on developing relationships and creating a sense of belonging for our students as worthy members of the student body at Saddleback College. And our faculty create a face-to-face -face environment that is welcoming and engaging and they emphasize that their students belong at Saddleback College. And so this face-to-face -face classroom environment takes time to develop and the faculty have carried over their classroom environment into their online community with their students. And creating a sense of belonging in an online environment is challenging, especially for students with intellectual disabilities and autism. It's possible to do, but it's harder for these students. So if you haven't done the work to create a strong sense of belonging in your face-to-face -face classrooms, you're gonna have a hard time moving online. So in the early days, there were lots of conversations at our campus, and a lot of those conversations were about doing a soft close. And a soft close meant that some of our courses would still be able to meet face-to-face. It was during this time I was asked to start thinking about what a soft close would look like for the OASIS program and what we would do in the event of a hard close. And a hard close meant that we would be teaching fully online. There were many questions that came to mind. So how are our students, are, are they willing and able to go online? You know, do we have time to teach students how to go online? Are the faculty willing to teach online? Like, what is Zoom? <laughs> Do I know how to log into Canvas? I, many of our faculty had never logged into Canvas before. And this was not a decision that I made on my own. I started asking these questions to the OASIS faculty and my administrator. I also knew that there was accessibility concerns that we needed to be thinking about as we made a decision to go online. I reached out to Mike Hoggett, who has experience teaching students with disabilities online is the DSPS department chair and is the founder of the OASIS program. I considered Mike a mentor and knew he could provide some guidance. So he's gonna speak more philosophically about preparing to go online. Thank you. Getting faculty to move from face-to-face -face instruction to something other takes more than a decision. Many of our faculty were willing but lack the skills and the knowledge necessary to do this well. To this end, we crammed weeks of training into days. Luckily, we had our spring break in order to do that. For me, my task was to focus on principles and allow the program faculty to work out the details. I focused on three areas, technical access, what I'll call cognitive access, and what I'd also call even emotional access, but more commonly engagement and motivation. While most of us understand the need to ensure access, and hopefully everyone here does, we often narrowly define it, which is a problem in online learning. As such, our goal was to get our faculty up and running with a broad knowledge of access. As we communicated these principles, the program faculty took practical steps to support students. So, I mean, of course, access means legal or technical access. I see in the chat, we're talking about captioning. We're talking about document headings, audio descriptors, using Kurzweil, JAWS, Fusion. 
we rely on these whether we're face-to-face -face or online. Yet many of our full uh, face-to-face part-time faculty who come from other environments surprisingly are often unfamiliar with the technical requirements, the ADA requirements. So we need to make sure that technical, technical access main, is a concern because it totally is. It's absolutely important that our faculty understand the technical requirements and someone teaches them. At Saddleback College, we are fortunate that we have a faculty center for student success and an institute for teaching and learning. And these two centers quickly provided training on campus accessibility, general accessibility for the entire campus. But here's my concern, and this is the thing that we stress with our faculty. Too often, students served by DSPS, students labeled with disabilities, particularly those labeled with intellectual disabilities or autism, only receive the minimum. What's the least the college has to do to ensure access? What's the least the college has to do to ensure compliance? And we wanted to make sure that we weren't just doing the least. So beginning the week of March 9th, a decision to go online had still not been made for the OASIS program. We had an emergency department meeting on Tuesday, March 10th, that included department chairs, managers, administrators, and lead staff to discuss a continuity plan for our adult education department, which includes adult ESL, high school equivalency, and adults with disabilities. In this meeting, we talked about what would happen if we went to a hard close. I said to my administrator that I was not sure if the OASIS courses would be would, could be taught online on such short notice. In fact, I said in this meeting that we ha if we had to go fully online, we may have to cancel our classes. It was decided in that meeting that each program was to develop a plan for a soft closure and to consider preparation for a hard close. I was asked to find out from faculty who had gone through Canvas training and what their technology expertise was. Our faculty had nearly zero experience with Canvas. Our last in-person meeting with students was Friday, March 13th. Worked very closely with my administrator, Dr. Karima Feldes, on developing a continuity plan. Karima had faith in me, the OASIS faculty, and our students as we worked together to develop a plan. Our program had full support from Karima, despite the fact that there were still questions unanswered about if we could go online and if it would be successful. It was vital that our faculty get trained on how to use Canvas. We also identified a need to schedule a, um, an opportunity for faculty to meet and discuss the continuity plan and give them an opportunity to give input and ask questions. The week of March 16th was spring break at Saddleback College. Nobody was going anywhere and if anyone had plans to go somewhere, those plans were most likely canceled. We had a meeting in the evening on Monday, March 16th with faculty attending either in person or via Zoom. We have 18 part-time faculty members in the OASIS program, including myself, and everyone had a chance to ask questions and give input to the continuity plan. On Tuesday, March 17th, there was a Canvas and Confer Zoom training offered by the Faculty Center for Student Success. After this training, I met with Mike, given his experience as a DSPS faculty member, and talked more in depth about accessibility using Canvas in the courses he teaches. On Wednesday, March 18th, the campus was closed down, except for essentially, and we had another all-faculty meeting via Zoom. By this time, it was clear that we were preparing to be fully online when we returned from spring break. Most of our faculty were on board and ready to dive in. We agreed with our students and in some cases caregivers was priority. If we were not able to communicate with them, we weren't going to be successful with anything we did online. Many students do not check their campus email accounts, have never logged into Canvas. The faculty worked tirelessly along with staff to connect via email and phone calls to get the word out that we were going online. Over the next few days, faculty got their feet wet with Canvas and started creating video tutorials and visual guides in order to teach students how to log into Canvas and use Confer Zoom. These guides were shared with students and or caregivers by the faculty. Saddleback College had a laptop computer loaners that were distributed to students in need. In some cases, caregivers picked up laptops. One of our faculty picked up a laptop and dropped it off to a group home where 11 of the students on her roster lived. 
The college and our division offered professional development stipends for attending trainings during spring break. Okay, so we're going online. <laughs> now what? The idea of asynchronous and synchronous instruction was explained by the chancellor's office and information was disseminated to the faculty. It was important to be mindful of what was happening at home for our students and what type of instruction would best meet their needs. It was decided that we'd use a combination of both, asynchronous and synchronous instruction. There was an emphasis on the idea that teaching online does not mean simply posting things online. We are teaching online. There was also an expectation that anything posted on Canvas had to meet legal accessibility requirements that Mike mentioned when referring to technical access. So we made this, we made the decision to go online and we crammed together some prep work, but we had to actually go online. And this is include, in, including our traditional credit courses as well as our non-credit courses for adults with disabilities. Was it perfect? No. But it didn't need to be necessarily perfect. We didn't want the idea of a perfect launch to derail us from doing something that was of quality that served our students. Initially, we did have to address the technical legal access, but we also needed to focus, particularly for our students identified as being on the autism spectrum or identified as having intellectual disabilities, the idea of cognitive access or instructional design, intentional design. So we're looking at, yeah, the college has provided some great tools. And for most of us, this is review. Hopefully, if you're in here, you're familiar with the requirements for technical access. But talking to your faculty and whether they're teaching in a non-credit program or they're teaching, you know, college algebra or geology, getting them to focus on intuitive design, universal design in an online platform and workflow become issues that need to be addressed beyond mere technical access. So is this important? It absolutely is. We encourage faculty, for one, to provide uh, an intro to Canvas shell. If they've never, if the students have never taken a class online, having a shell that may be optional in the, the Canvas uh, LMS that gets students to practice using some of the features, whether it's a discussion board or a quiz or whatever, is a nice low key, non-anxiety producing opportunity just to get used to it. We encourage faculty to, to keep the students in the course to get them flowing within the course. So what does this mean? Well, it's not uncommon for faculty to just add a link or add a, attach a file. The problem with that, every time a student clicks on that, they're taken out of Canvas and they have to go back into it. And for some of our students, the cognitive burden on that is just too great. So getting faculty to focus on that became important. We focused on design and flow. Does it make sense? Does it logically go from one to the other? Is it intuitive? We, we talked about for, for general faculty and for the non-credit faculty, and I work with both, so I'm talking to both. We talked a lot about direct instruction. And what I mean by direct instruction is not what maybe K-12 means. What I mean is this is exactly how you're supposed to do this assignment taking certain assumptions out of the online environment becomes important. Um, not just taking those out, but also modeling assignments. So if you're doing, say, a discussion board, you model a discussion board post. Many of our students are reluctant to, to contribute for fear of not doing it right. And so having that direct instruction, keeping students in the course, and then finding other means of engagement. So we have, um, you know, we have faculty making YouTube videos. We have faculty doing completely Zoom because their class has trouble logging into Canvas. We've been able to provide laptop access to group homes so that the entire group home can, can get into that class. 
regardless of how it's being done, making sure that the flow, the, the instructional design benefits all. This is what universal design and learning is. And too many of our faculty are simply, and, I, and I'm not speaking just to our adults with disabilities, I'm speaking to our general faculty, just simply post documents online without having an instructional flow. But we also had to address the idea of engagement and motivation and how are we maintaining contact. Maintaining contact is different in different types of courses. While so many people focused on can students with intellectual disabilities or with autism access the course, there was way too little emphasis placed on do they even want to, do they care to, is there anything that is motivating for them to do so. This is particularly true when it's a non-credit course or an open entry, open access course. While many administrators may take our students' participation for granted, we wanted to encourage faculty to kind of earn the right to be heard approach. Faculty more than the content are what keeps students engaged and motivated. We had to, re we had to make sure faculty understood that good online instruction was not just moving face to face on online because the medium is the message or the medium changes the message and talking with faculty about that and then acknowledging the differences that different learning approaches require in an online environment and then giving options for connection and engagement the meaningful effective engagement announcements uh, using Google I use Google voice for text all the time you know, whether it's email, meaningful content. One thing that was new for some of our non-credit was building out assignments because assignments provide an opportunity for meaningful feedback on student performance and work, whether regardless of the grading environment. So, I mean, is engagement motivation important? Totally. So while technical access and instructional design are necessary to get going, we need students to keep going. This is where the relational part comes in. And this is the important thing, whether it's instructional assistants, whether it's program staff, whether it's faculty, whether it's DSPS counselors, is the connection. Is the program or the connecting with individual students, individual caregivers, with individual community partners, this idea that, oh, I'm going to build the perfect shell and everything is going to be hunky-dory just doesn't work out. This is not a field of dreams model. If we build it, they will come. They may initially when it's novel, but maintaining access into the summer, into the fall requires relationship. Stacy will talk about maintenance and evaluating our success. Uh, she'll talk about things that are working, others that aren't. But one thing's for sure. It is important that we continually inquire of students and faculty during this transition so that we can make course corrections, so that we can make interventions. As a DSPS counselor, it's connecting with students and how are things going in your classes? Connecting with fellow faculty. This is one of the opportunities we have to correct. This is, in some ways, we are now the, putting ourselves in a student mentality and getting this kind of course feedback so that we can improve our performance or, 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 or what have you in real time. Okay, so today marks the end of the fourth week. We've been 100% online. And we're still making adjustments as we go and it's still not perfect. And I'm going to share with you now some of the things that have been working and some of the things that have not. So what is working so far? Uh, first and foremost, our faculty have taken ownership of doing the best they can to engage with students. And our faculty truly understand that students with disabilities are one of the most isolated populations during this time of quarantine. They've also built their classroom environments in our program on our program foundation that our students belong at Saddleback College. And if the student body at Saddlepack were going to be going online, then that's going to include our students with disabilities as well. 
We also would not be where we are without the support of our administration. Another thing that is working is that students are participating and they're actually engaged online. Some of our online courses have had the same number of students participating online as they were in person. Some of our courses have about half participating and some have minimal engagement. Faculty are developing content for Canvas and scheduling Zoom meetings on a regular basis. Some faculty are scheduling these during the same time they would have met in person. And in some cases, students who rarely participated in class due, due to challenges with being in the classroom environment, which has a lot of social interactions, they're actually participating more online through Canvas and Zoom. Another thing that has um, contributed to what's working so far is a strong connection and relationship with one of our local adult transition programs. This relationship has been instrumental in supporting our communication with students. And lastly, we've redefined what success looks like because for some, it may just be considered a success to connect with faculty. So what is not working? We do have students who are not engaged in all, at all, and regardless of how much we've uh, attempted to communicate and connect with them. And this is due to several factors, including a lack of support at home. Some of our students live with parents who are not working. Some students who live in group homes and in their home, their in-home staff are not supportive. There's also a struggle for some students to get online and not having support at home to get online. We also have some faculty who are reluctant to go online. And lastly, there is a struggle with motivating some of our students because some of our students are enjoying the quarantine life, being at home and doing the things they wanna do. So these students most likely don't have any external motivation from their families, caregivers, or from themselves. So moving forward, uh, it's important that we continuously evaluate what we are doing. Both myself and Karima are connecting with faculty on a regular basis to see how things are going, to get feedback, and to offer any support. I'm teaching one of our courses this semester and I consistently am checking in with my students on how things are going with Canvas and Zoom and in their lives in general. And this summer we will be 100% online and expect to continue what we are doing. It's going to be a little more difficult going into the summer term without the time we had in the spring to be in person before the transition online and getting to know our students. We are planning to start the fall semester online and are currently working on the schedule. Like I mentioned, I connect with faculty on a regular basis and I'm teaching a course this semester and get input from my students on what they like and what is working. Here are some recommendations based on input from our faculty and our students. Be consistent and predictable with communication and due dates. Students want to know when assignments are due, when Zoom is scheduled, and how often you send communication. When you, do these, when you do these things on a consistent and predictable basis, students are more likely to engage. For example, every Sunday a new module is released and any assignment in that module is due the following Sunday. It is recommended to communicate on a regular basis, however, not every day. That is just too much and students will tune you out. And I would too. <laughs> Schedule Zoom meetings or office hours that are again, consistent and predictable. When developing content in Canvas, try to format in ways that students stay in Canvas. If a student has to click on a link and takes them to YouTube, they may go to Canvas. Students tend to also prefer quizzes and discussion boards. They really look forward to our Zoom meetings and a chance to be able to see faculty and their fellow students. My final thought to leave you with is that our students continue to surprise us at Saddleback and we continue to develop a community where students feel like they belong, whether we are face-to-face -face or online. And I believe with that, we have time for some questions. Great, thank you so much. Uh, so there were some questions from uh, Alison Gold, but it looks like some of them have been removed. Let's see. So. This was a comment that was made. Uh, my biggest concern is the accessibility to our students and their ability to access the coursework. If 
uh, Dr. Haggad or Stacey, you want to make comments to that, that'd be great. Yeah, I'll talk to that. Um, that should be our biggest concern. Um, it should be everybody's concern whether you're teaching advanced biochem or whether you're teaching an independent living skills course. And for me, in like I teach a math course, I also teach reading courses. If it stops being a concern, we have a problem. And one of my responsibilities then is when I am interacting with my, my colleagues in the English department or the math department is to emphasize that concern. I can take care of my own class from an access standpoint, but one of the important things that I can do within my, my role as a fellow faculty member is to stress that very point across the board. Great, thank you so much. Uh, if there are additional questions, please feel free to uh, insert them into the chat box. I believe that we have been uh, doing a better job um, at responding to them directly in the chat. Um, also, um, if you would, the very last item in the chat feature right now is a request for you to click on a link to complete an evaluation. We're not sure if the link is live and if it's working. If you could please test it and let me know, that would be great. Maybe, uh, Christina, what we might want to do is simply insert the link without the language before it and let's see if that will uh, enable it. That might be a good idea. Thank you so much. Um, great, we have additional questions. Um, how have you addressed students using their mobile phone for Canvas? Karsten, thank you for this question. I believe I saw this before and we didn't address it. So, so thank you for placing it here again. So the question is, how have you addressed students using their mobile phone for Canvas? Canvas is not mobile device friendly. Menu options are different. This definitely causes a lot of confusion. Tell me about it. Um, <laughs> you know, one of, one of the problems, this is a problem with Canvas, okay? Just, if you're in a California community college, there's pros and cons of Canvas, but Canvas is what we're stuck with. For those students who must use their phones, so for, for my students, I talk to them about this, hey, please, you know, use, access Canvas from something else, typically. If you must use your phone, then we have these, it's usually a smaller percentage, and it becomes these conversations about how, how do we do it. One of the things, it depends on the type of phone, but students don't like typing into Canvas from their phone. So they have, you know, a text box fill. So I do know students who will use like the Google Keep feature and then copy and paste that into Canvas on their phone. It's not ideal. It is... Less, I mean, anytime you're using Canvas from your phone, it's less than ideal. But using some of, especially from an Android phone, some of the Google features, um, including using some of the voice typing into Notes or Google Keep, that's proved somewhat helpful. So using a, the voice, voice to text in Google Keep and then copying and pasting that into Canvas, some students do that. There's not a lot of great options. For some of the technical aspects, I would highly encourage, um, talk to your, if you're at a California Community College, talk to your alt media specialist, or you know, if you have a faculty center, a technology center, talk to them as well for some, from some workarounds. Or if you have someone who is the point person for your distance education, you know, look at some additional options. I'd like to chime in on that. This is Angela. Um, I have I was given the suggestion from our distance ed coordinators to download the Canvas app as a student as well as an instructor, so that when I go in as a student, I can see what they're seeing because it looks very different than what I see on my instructor side. And then uh, from if I pretend I'm a student and I'm going through the module that day, I can say I can see like oh well this might be an issue. I can make this easier. Let me change this. Um, so that has been helpful as well. Um, I know students are more apt to use their phones first for everything. So I always try to uh, make sure that, you know, I keep that in mind. 
Great, a couple of questions. One has to do with, it seems like people are asking what OASIS uh, stands for. OASIS stands for Occupational and Academic Skills for Independence and Success. It's the Adult with Disabilities non-credit program at Saddleback College. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Uh, Dr. Sala, I see that you wanna ask a question, but I'm not seeing the question in the chat. Feel free uh, to text me and I will read your question. Um, so we are sorry that it seems like the evaluation link is not working. If you could please do us a favor, um, I will email that to you. If you could just click on the link and respond to the questions, that would be great. I've added a question regarding uh, mental health and well-being. I think that that's something that we might want to get some answers to regarding your students. We'll really appreciate that. People are asking me whether, um, whether you will be able to have access to the PowerPoints as well as to a recording of this webinar, and the answer is yes. Everyone who attended, everyone who registered will have access to this information. Okay, so the questions. Uh, um, hey, Will, can I, I, I want to address, there was a question about uh, for students who struggle with reading or writing um, within an online environment. Can I address that right now? Sure, please, yeah. Okay, so one of the things that I do is m for my announcements, so I, I, I rely on announcements heavily to to kind of get students ready for the week or, or, or just to prepare them. And I do my announcements as video announcements. I, I use Otter AI. It's my app, my transcription app. Someone had asked about transcription apps and there's a lot of transcription services, the DECT grant. Um, for me, I, I use Otter AI. So what I do is my, my, announcements are video announcements and included in that same announcement is the full transcript so students can choose to either read it or to see and listen to it um, from the writing standpoint it, it really depends on the technological savvy of the student but if i can get them within canvas one of the options is a voice thread so here's two things that we've done is one when you have an assignment or anything, you can click down on Canvas saying, hey, how do I want this to be submitted? Text only, a file upload. But I can also do, do media and allow students to do a voice thread. And if worse comes to worse, by having my, my Google Voice, if as long as it's not some three to four page essay, students can always call my Google Voice number which will translate that voice thread into text that I can then respond to either verbally or in writing. So, so a lot of it is about being creative with how I'm allowing students to communicate. There's nothing wrong with voicemail. And I know it's like, well, we're on Canvas, we're online, we gotta do something fancier than voicemail. But occasionally allowing students to use voicemail is a great way for them to provide feedback also the voice threads in Canvas. And then for me is making sure that I'm providing information to students in multiple formats. So not just video or voice, but also the text, not just the transcription, but actually the full, the full transcription as a set aside document. My goal when I teach online is to provide, again, multiple means of communication, but also, also multiple means of reception of that communication, depending on the student's needs. Thank you so much. All right, so I will continue to read some of the comments and questions here. Uh, let's see. How will you work with new students in the summer and fall transition from high school to onboard to the college? Um, I can speak for the non-credit sure. portion of that. Mm -hmm. uh, I have been uh, Zoom conferences. It's all about doing, uh, so I do um, intakes with all new students just to make sure that the program will be appropriate for them and they are prepared for the program. And so I have been offering Zoom conferences um, as well as phone calls 
as well as texting. So uh, I, I, have a, I have a good working relationship with OUSD Adult Transition Program and some other folks. And so I think I've sent them the information that new families that are looking to take our non-credit courses and our, our department, that's how they can get a hold of me. And for the OASIS program, we do not have any sort of intake process. And so students usually are going through our DSPS counselors or they're calling our adult ed staff directly to get information about how to register for courses. And so um, we will still need to figure out how we can provide support to students who are, are new, but we already have a kind of a foundation built with the video tutorials and the visual guides that faculty have created to access Canvas and their student email accounts. And so that we'll probably be sharing those with new students. So another question is, are you allowing recording of Zoom and releasing it to students? I don't, I'm not sure if someone answered that already. I think Angela talked about her that they don't. We, I would say, don't either. For faculty, they're not recording their Zoom sessions with students and making them available at a later time. We're just using the Zoom platform as a meeting space for students not recording those sessions. Mm -hmm. So the folks, apparently there were several individuals who were hoping for strategies in working with students with ID who don't read and write. And I know that Dr. Huggett addressed some of that a, a moment ago. Um, I'm hoping that we satisfied your question, but if you don't and you'd like to uh, cl further clarification, please let us know. Um, Great. I'm some fielding. I'm looking for other questions. I just want to make sure I don't miss any. If you've asked a question and for some reason we've missed it, if you don't mind, I'm really trying to get to all of them. So if you would insert your question again, that'd be great. Okay. Uh, here we go. Okay. Uh, people are saying, Thank you, and that was great information. I'm looking for additional questions, though. Um, there's a comment uh, saying that um, you say that the students believe they're a part of Saddleback Community College, and the person was making a comment that you're doing a great job, and from their perspective, the students are a part of your campus, so they just wanted to make that comment. Um, Okay, I'll keep looking for questions. In the meantime, I do want to begin uh, by thanking our presenters today, uh, Angela Guevara, Stacy Eldred, and Dr. Michael Haggard. Thank you so much for sharing the wealth of your knowledge and your um, new experiences in this, in this um, new emerging online higher education environment and atmosphere that we're all working through. Um, an additional question is, um, I had a question regarding the SPS math um, class at SCC. Is it lab? Is it a lecture? Is it single level, multi-level? And the number of units, please. So I was actually just furiously typing back to that. Um, our math class that I was referring to is through non-credit. So there are no credits. Uh, um, attached to it, we have a, a pass or a satisfactory progress. And the class is basics. So it's basic addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, and measurement. We at Saddleback do have a credit um, EAC math course. So an educational assistance course. We have a, a math course which mirrors um, similar to a pre-algebra course. We also have a math course that is more of a lab, which is focused on learning strategies and learning activities related to students in higher level math courses. Both of those traditionally have been offered as either face-to-face -face or online. The, both of them rely heavily on 
even when they're face to face, rely heavily on using Canvas. So all of the students who are in those courses, they need the extra support. And so the class works as a supplemental instruction to whatever other class. So if they're in the, say the, the pre-algebra sequence or the beginning algebra sequence, or they're taking a higher level math course and really just need some organization, planning, assistance, some study, some test taking strategies, some stress, anxiety management, then that's for them as well. So that's what we offer at Saddleback. Mm -hmm. uh, so Stacy, you mentioned that not all of the students that you have reached out to have engaged or are engaged. Um, what methods seem more effective in engaging students? I, I don't know if students with ID just generally, broadly, obviously an individualized approach is best, but I don't know if you saw some trends in students being more responsive to, to certain uh, kinds of outreach than others. So what could you say about um, what seemed to work in reaching out to students? So, I mean, in regards to, you know, best practices for instruction for students with intellectual disabilities, I mean, online platform is not necessarily ideal in many situations for students. So there's that piece. And then there's also the piece of connecting with the students who have an intellectual disability that maybe don't have uh, strong communication skills and so they rely on someone like a caregiver mm -hmm. and that connection to the caregiver tends to be where the breakdown is um, and you know we've done our best in a lot of the the student cases that we have and in some we just we just flat out have not been able to connect with some students because of that Great, thank you. Dr. Haggard, I noticed you stole that question from out under us. That's good that you responded to it in the chat. Great, thank you. The question had to do with um, what the number of weeks schedule that the campuses were on. Uh, let's see, was there another question? Okay, great, I think that's a new one. Here we go. How have you supported students on the spectrum who have felt overstimulated with new Zoom, with the new Zoom online environment, with seeing all classmates at once, trying to keep track of the classes, as well as trying to complete a practical course online and feeling so overwhelmed, having a hard time controlling their facial expressions and struggling with social response in class. I, I don't require you to use video because I don't want to use video half the time. So I am not going to put the pressure on you to have to show your face uh, if you don't want to, because maybe you haven't taken a shower that day. I don't know. I don't know what's going on. And as long as you are in class and you are uh, getting the outcomes, that's all that really matters to me. So again, I don't, I don't push the video option. Um, at, at Saddleback, I'll speak to the courses I teach. I teach a transfer level study skills and learning strategies course, which is really geared around students with more intellectual needs and students on the spectrum. And one of the things we did several years ago, we decided to take that class online largely as in response to some of the needs that were expressed by our students who who identified as being on the spectrum and what we decided to do was not like angela said not require video conferencing but what we what we wanted to do was give an opportunity for those students who in a social environment have more challenges to give them an opportunity to still contribute to a classroom that's where the discussion board so i have i have a online course that learning strategies class which is predominantly enrolled with students who identify as being on the spectrum. The discussion boards are sometimes entertaining, sometimes inappropriate, but they're robust because it's an opportunity to communicate thoughts without the, 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 the added social pressure of a Zoom face-to-face -face or sometimes even the in-face class. So 
that's something that we've done. And yeah, I wouldn't require, I, I'm just personally not a big fan of the synchronous Zoom instruction, but you know, that's, that's an instructor's, instructor's purview, but my recommendation is not to require it and to make sure before there's any type of meeting that students understand how to block the video. Mm. Thank you. Great. Uh, I think uh, that will be it for this particular webinar. Again, thank you so much, Angela, Stacy, and Dr. Haggard for sharing uh, everything that you're experiencing in this environment with, with the team. Um, and thank you to all of our community college partners, uh, to those who support the work that we do at the community colleges. Thank you so much for participating in the webinar today. Um, I will be here for a little while longer if you have additional questions. Um, and we will get back to you uh, with, the, with responses to your questions. Again, you can expect that I will provide a link to the audio and video recording, as well as a link to the evaluation so that you could uh, provide us some feedback. Uh, that information is going to be critical to us as we will use it for the planning of additional webinars. Um, um, yeah, question now, is there a platform for all of us to discuss and share ideas. I want to say that something like that is currently in the works that I'm aware of, and you'll be hearing something from us soon. Again, thank you to everyone for joining us. Please stay healthy and stay safe. Thanks, Will. Thanks, Will. Thank you, Will. You're thank you, welcome. Will. Thank you. I see another question. Can you share this information with your colleagues? Absolutely. Please. <laughs> yes, please. We, the, the idea is to share this information far and wide. Uh, in the state of California, we're serving more than 7,000 individuals with an intellectual disability and more than 9,000 students with autism. There is nowhere else in the country where that number of individuals are being served in, a, in the community college system or in higher education for that matter. So we need more individuals with training, with strategies, and to build the capacity of the state. That's why we do this work. Again, thank you for your participation. Yeah, I muted myself, but I'll end this now. Thank you all. Thank you all.